Well, good afternoon to you all again, ladies and gentlemen. This is the final of our summer series of seminars. And as you can see, our task today is to provide you with the information that we think you need so as to understand the sinus phenosis defect. Now, you'll all be well aware that we've discussed this before. So I hope that you all appreciate sinus phenosis defect is a channel permitting shunting between the atrial chambers, but one that is outside the confines of the atrial septum. Now, what does this mean? It means that we can justifiably describe the lesion as an interatrial communication, but in that it is outside the confines of the atrial septum, we cannot call it an atrial septal defect. And that's what we're going to concentrate upon today. So how can we have the situation where you have a channel that's interatrial shunting, but is not within the confines of the atrial septum? And that is what we're going to try to describe. So in order to clarify the morphology, I am going to start by sharing with you again, material that you've seen before, the changes that occur during development of the normal atrial septum. So you'll not be surprised to know that I'm going to share with you again these spectacular three-dimensional files, these interactive files that were made by Professor Wout Lamas and Dr. Jill Hickspurs. And I've told you many times now that they are working in the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. So this is a, a cutaway from one of their interactive PDF files. As you can see in the top left-hand corner, it's coming from a human embryo. CS by now, I hope you appreciate, means carnity stage. So this is stage 12. And at this stage, the embryo is just getting in to the fifth week of development. So what I've done to make this picture from the interactive file is I've taken away the walls so that you can see what's going on within the cavities. So let me orientate you. Coming towards us there, we see the apical component of the developing left ventricle. And that is ballooning from the inlet component of the ventricular loop. So to your left hand, right side of the embryo, you see the ballooning apical component of the developing right ventricle. And then continuing to the margins of the pericardial cavity, you see the outflow tract. Now, if we look behind the ventricular loop, you can see the body of the developing atrium. And I hope you all appreciate that at this stage, the atrial chamber is a common entity. It has not yet been septated. But our focus in this early part of development is going to be here upon the venous tributaries. And the venous tributaries are entering the atrial component through what we call the sinus horns. Now, you can't see it terribly well in this particular image because I'm showing it to you from the front. So let's turn the whole thing around, same embryo, and let's look at it from behind. And this is one of the beauties of the interactive files that have been developed by Wout and Jill. You can take them apart, put them back together. You can view them in any orientation you want. So here we're now looking at the same thing from behind. And now very nicely, you can see that common body of the atrium, which is the atrial component of the primary heart tube. You'll note that at this stage, it still has this small connection with the pharyngeal mesenchyme. And this is body stalk. We also call this the dorsal mesocardium. Now, the key point at this stage, Carnegie stage 12, is that the left sinus horn is still connected to the body of the developing atrium, as is the right sinus horn. And coming in to both sinus horns, we have the systemic venous tributaries. And there are three tributaries at this stage, the umbilical veins, 
midline veins, and then the cardinal veins that are draining the blood back from the embryo itself. Key point at this stage, they are bilaterally symmetrical. Now, this is Carnegie stage 12. There is a remarkable change that occurs by the time we can look at the next stage. Two days have passed during human development, so now we're towards the middle of the fifth week of development, Carnegie stage 13. Again, we're looking at it from behind, but look what has happened to the systemic venous sinus. It has shifted, and now the systemic venous sinus is opening only into the right side of the initial atrial component of the primary heart tube. So now we can call this the developing right atrium. There you can see the left side. We can now call this the developing left atrium, but you will see the developing left atrium has now lost its connection with the left sinus horn. In fact, as I'm going to show you very shortly, the left sinus horn has incorporated itself within the developing left atrioventricular groove as the entirety systemic venous sinus shifts rightward so as to open into the right side what initially was a common atrial cavity. Now, the, uh, the atrial component itself has retained its connection to the pharyngeal mesenchyme, kind, but in fact, that also has expanded. We're now showing it to you in pink. And this is an important structure. You've heard us mention it on many times. This is the vestibular spine or the dorsal mesenchymal protrusion. So let's turn the whole thing around again and look at it from the front. Same stage, Carnegie stage 13, 35 days of development. This time I'm showing it to you in one of the episcopic data sets prepared by my very good friend, Tim Mohan. So there, nicely, you see the venous valves. And we can beautifully now see how opening into the venous valves, we have the opening of what will become the superior cable vein. There is the opening of what is destined to become the inferior cable vein. And now we can see the left sinus horn incorporated into the left atrioventricular junction. We can now see that with the rightward shift, the systemic venous sinus and its venous valves, the primary septum can begin to grow from the roof of the atrial component of the primary heart tube. And that is separating what will end up as the body of the right atrium from the body of the left atrium. And most of the body of the atrium will remain on the left side. But you can also see very nicely now how the left sinus horn is now separated from the developing left atrium. That was the arrangement, as I showed you in an episcopic data set. We can also show it to you in a histologic section. So this is from a slightly older embryo, but it's more or less the same stage of development. So this is one of the embryos from the human developmental biology resource housed at Newcastle University. It's a beautiful section. To your left hand, you can see the ballooning appendage of the right atrium, which is growing out from the body of the right atrium. But there again, you see the systemic venous sinus, which is confined within the venous valves. Beautifully now, you see how the left sinus horn has its own walls that are separate from those of the developing left atrium. And there, growing from the roof of the primary component of the atrium, we see the primary atrial septum, and there you see the vestibular spine. But if you look very carefully, and remember this is a section taken at the back of the heart, you can see another channel there. And that now is the channel of the developing pulmonary vein. And that is being pushed into the developing left atrium by the development of the vestibular spine. So let's go back a little bit, Carnegie stage 14, in a frontal section, four chamber section. You'll recognize, I hope, the right atrium, left atrium. At this early stage of development, the atrioventricular canal is looking exclusively into what will become 
the left ventricle. But I want to direct your attention to the roof of the atrial chambers, because there, growing from the roof, you see the spur that will become the primary set. The key point from the outset of development, it has on its leading edge what we call the mesenchymal cap. And as the primary septum grows towards the atrioventricular canal, separating the right from the left atrial chambers, so it carries on its leading edge that mesenchymal cap. So here we are, Carnegie stage 14. Let's go forward one stage, another histologic section, Carnegie stage 15. Because now you can see what has happened with that growth of the primary atrial septum. Again, you can see the venous valves that are enclosing tributaries, systemic venous sinus. But now I want to concentrate on what is happening as the primary septum grows towards the cushions within the atrioventricular canal. Because again, on the leading edge of that primary septum, we see the mesenchymal cap. And it is the space between the mesenchymal cap and the cushions of the atrioventricular canal that is the primary foramen, if you will, the ostium femen. And very shortly, that primary foramen is going to close. But still, we need the potential for the umbilical venous blood coming back into the right atrium to get to the left side. And that is achieved by the breakdown of the cranial part of the primary atrial septum. So now you see we can recognize the secondary foramen the ostium secundum, if you will. So this is the situation as we see it in the developing human heart. We can also see it very nicely at the same stage in the developing murine heart. So here is the frontal section, a four-chamber section, through another of Dr. Mohan's episcopic data sets. In the mouse, this is embryonic day 11.5. You can see very nicely that there has been expansion of the atrioventricular canal. So the cavity of the right atrium will look directly into the cavity of the developing right ventricle. So there now you see the primary septum. As I have discussed, it is broken down in its roof so that we have the secondary foramen, but on its leading edge, we have the mesenchymal cap, and as the primary septum with the mesenchymal cap grows towards the atrioventricular cushions, in this instance, in inferior cushion, it diminishes the size of the primary foramen. And we can look at a, another episcopic date, data set from day 11.5, and we can see what happens as that growth continues. So there is the primary septum again with its mesenchymal cap. There is the inferior cushion. This time the primary foramen is smaller, but you can now see that second key structure that contributes to the closure of that primary foramen, and that is the vestibular spine. And you can see it truly is a spine-like structure that is growing into the back of the heart from the pharyngeal reason kind. And that serves to push the pulmonary vein, which has canalized within the pharyngeal mesenchyme into the cavity of the left atrium. And I can show you that if I return to a human embryonic data set, again, a section of the Human Biology Development Resource in Newcastle, on E stage 14, we're cutting through the back of the atrioventricular canal, and there you can see the tissue of the vestibular spine, and now beautifully, you can see the pulmonary vein, which itself is branching into the right, left pulmonary veins, and it is being committed into the left atrium by the growth of the vestibular spine. But there is another key point to remember. So this is another embryo, again at Carnegie stage 14, but this time it is sectioned in parasternal long axis plane. So there you see the body of the left atrium, there you see the developing left ventricle. And very nicely, you can see the cushions in the atrioventricular canal. But what you can also see very nicely is how the left sinus horn has become incorporated 
to what will become the left atrial ventricular junction. And this shows you again very nicely that the left sinus horn from the outset has its own walls, which are discrete from the walls of the left atrium. But now we've cut across that opening of the canalized pulmonary vein. Remember, I showed you that just a moment ago. It is canalizing within the pharyngeal mesenchyme. It's connecting the heart to the developing lungs, which are developing within the pharyngeal mesenchyme. The key point at this stage, as this section shows you very beautifully, the solitary pulmonary vein is directly adjacent to the left sinus horn within the left atrioventricular junction. But you all know full well that when development is complete, the pulmonary veins do not open adjacent to the atrioventricular junction. They open to the roof of the left atrium. And this does not happen during development until much later during the embryonic period. So here, in fact, we're seeing the beginning of that migration of pulmonary veins to the atrial roof. So we're at Carnegie stage 21. This is during the seventh week of embryonic development. Again, I'm showing you a four chamber section. And there you can see the pulmonary venous component opening into the left atrium. Let's blow it up and let's look what's happening relative to the atrial septum. Because remember, we're trying to understand all of this in the context of why sinus venosus defect is not an atrial septal defect, but is an interatrial irritation. So now this section shows us very beautifully the formation of the normal oval fossa. Again, you can see venous valves, and they are enclosing the systemic venous sinus. But now there we see the oval fossa, and this shows us that the floor of the oval fossa, what we call the flat valve, is made up of the primary atrial septum. And this is key. The oval fossa is floored by the primary atrial septum. But the primary atrial septum itself has become attached to the developing atrioventricular junctions. And this is the true secondary septum. And it is formed by muscularization of those mesenchymal structures I've already shown you. The mesenchymal cap that is carried on the leading edge of the atrial septum, along with a stimulus spine, which pushed pulmonary vein initially into the cavity of the left edge. But what has happened as the pulmonary veins have moved on to the roof of the left atrium? It is that migration of pulmonary veins to the roof of the left atrium that creates what is still described as a septum secundum in many textbooks, as, but as you see most clearly in this section through a developing embryonic heart, it is not a septum at all. It is the superior interatrial fold. And it is a fold between the wall of developing right pulmonary vein and the body of the right atrium, which is incorporated on the right side of the atrial septum between the left venous valve and the superior interatrial fold. So this has created a situation that we can now see in the postnatal heart. And I can show you that in this beautiful drawing that has been made by my good friend and colleague, Jenna Price. She is now a freelance artist. She worked for me for many years, and she is a superb artist. And this picture comes from a paper we published recently with my colleagues from the All India Institute, clarifying, again, the anatomy of the sinus venosus defect. But this is showing us the normal arrangement of the oval fossa. So there is the oval fossa, and we show you again how the floor of the oval fossa is the flat valve. And remember, I've shown you that is the primary atrial septum. So the true secondary atrial septum is now what we call the antero inferior buttress of the atrial septum. And remember, this is formed by muscularization of 
Mas han kommer ka from the vestibule of spine. So what used to be called secondary septum is not a septum at all, and this is key to understanding the anatomy of the sinus phenosis defect. It is the superior interatrial fold, and it is the fold between the attachment of the right pulmonary veins to the left atrium, the superior cable vein to the right atrium. Now, I've shown you that in terms of development. I've now illustrated it to you using a diagram. But let's now see the real thing. So what Diane is now going to do, she's going to show you the specimens, the anatomy of the oval fossa, these key points, the anteroinferior buttress, superior and tracheal fold. And then Justin will use living data sets demonstrate using virtual dissection how you can now see the same features the anteroinferior buttress superior interatrial fold the, the arrangement of the oval fossa using living human data sets we're going to start today by looking at the true components of the atrial septum and those areas that make up the interatrial folds. So this is our morphologically right atrial appendage with its blunt tip and its broad junction with the venous component. When we look inside of the atrium, here we can see the superior cable vein joining its roof and the inferior cable vein joining its floor. The systemic venous sinus is a very smooth area as is the right atrial vestibule, which extends between the distal extent of the pectinate muscles and the hinge point of the tricuspid valve. You'll also note that the pectinate muscles extend between those two smooth components of the atrium, namely the, ves the vestibule and the smooth venous sinus. The coronary sinus is located just here, inferiorly. Many people think that this entire area makes up the extent of the atrial septum when in reality, it is just made up of two components. The first of which is the primary atrial septum or the flat valve at the floor of the oval fossa. And then the secondary component, which is the anterior inferior muscular buttress. Mm -hmm. This area extends between that muscular rim of the oval fossa and the hinge point of the tricuspid valve. So when we look at the posterior lateral aspect of the atriums, we can see the right atrium here and the left atrium here. The superior cable vein is entering the roof of the right atrium and the pulmonary veins on the right entering the roof of the left atrium. I have this area dissected between the atriums and this interatrial groove is sometimes known as Waterston's or Sondergaard's groove. When you look at this interatrial fold, you can see just how extensive this fold can be. And here, where I'm moving my probe, is the posterior most rim of the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa. So this is where the true interatrial septum is connected to this very deep interatrial fold. I'll also mention the fact that these pulmonary veins on the right are in very close proximity to the superior cable vein, but lie across that interatrial fold. Another interatrial fold occurs between the inferior cable vein and the coronary sinus, so that here you can see my probe extending into that interatrial fold up to the border of where that secondary component of the atrial septum is, or that anterior inferior muscular buttress. And you can also see the coronary sinus along the inferior aspect of that fold. If we look at the left side of the atrial septum, here you can see the narrow junction of the left atrial appendage and that smooth atrial vestibule. In this area, you can see this horseshoe structure, which is where the flat valve at the floor of the oval fossa is attaching to the superior interatrial fold. Here I have my probe through this probe patent oval foramen, and you can see the extent of the atrial septum here where I'm moving my probe, and that this opening is more of a tunnel than a true hole. Also, you can see where those uh, 
attachments within the left atrium are attaching to that superior interatrial fold just by where I'm moving my probe. It's along the fold, not along the edge of the true posterior aspect of that atrial septum. So that the flap valve is adherent to that superior interatrial fold. And here you can see the right pulmonary veins entering the roof of the left atrium. If we take a look at a four chamber preparation of a normal heart, we can again show nicely the true components of the atrial septum along with the interatrial fold. So this is our morphologically right atrium with our, it's our pectinated appendage. And here is our smooth left atrial vestibule. There you can see the inferior cable vein along the inferior aspect or the diaphragmatic aspect. And here's where the superior cable vein would have entered the roof of the right atrium. This is the cut edge of the terminal crest. The right pulmonary veins are entering the roof of the left atrium just on the left side of this interatrial fold. And here you can see the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa, which is our primary component of our atrial septum. This is where it is overlapping or becoming adherent to that superior interatrial fold. This muscular structure is our anterior inferior muscular buttress. And this is our true secondary component of the atrial septum. And in this area is where we will see a vestibular atrial septal defect. You can also see nicely the normal offset of the atrioventricular valves and the atrioventricular component of the membranous septum. In this CT data set of a normal heart, we'll review the normal anatomy of atrial septum. We'll start with a four chamber virtual dissection cut viewing the right and the left atrium, the right and the left ventricle. And here is the primary atrial septum. Posteriorly is the posterior interatrial fold, which is positioned rightward relative to the primary atrial septum. And then coming anteriorly, we see the anterior inferior muscular buttress. And then we'll, we'll cut this into a right anterior oblique view. So we're looking at the rightward aspect of the atrial and the ventricular septum the superior cable vein and inferior cable vein coming into the right atrium. Here is the primary atrial septum forming the oval fossa and surrounding it in a C configuration is the superior posterior and inferior interatrial folds. Anterior and inferiorly is the muscular buttress leading up to the area of the triangle of cock. And then anterior superior is the aortic mouth normally formed by the non-coronary sinus. And so now we're zoomed up in the area of the triangle of cock formed by the hinge line of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, inferiorly by the coronary sinus, and then by the tendon of Tadaro at its apex being the membranous septum. And we're seeing a portion of the oval fossa and the anterior inferior muscular buttress. And then we'll make the myocardium translucent and we'll shift so we see the entirety of the primary atrial septum or oval fossa shown here. And as I mentioned, now we, we see the epicardial fat, which is forming a C configuration, which is within those, the superior, posterior, and inferior interatrial folds. And with no fat enter inferiorly where that muscular buttress is or in the, the area of the aortic mouth enter superiorly. And then just to color the confines of the triangle of cock as we discussed. And I have mentioned this before, but this is an excellent review in Hard in 2018, led by our colleague Shumpi Mori with his reconstruction shown here of a patient with a secundum atrial septal defect or, or deficient oval fossa. And likewise to my images before, he's made the myocardium translucent in panel D, showing that C configuration of the superior posterior and inferior interatrial folds with the epicardial fat in between. I would highly recommend this review of normal and congenitally malformed atrial um, anatomy, including interatrial defects and atrial septal defects. So before we get on to the sinus phenosis defect, let's pause for a moment 
And let's put that development and that anatomy that we've now seen shown using specimens, using living data sets, let's put that into the context of true atrial septal defects. Because by now, I hope you appreciate that we can have true atrial septal defects produced by two mechanisms, either by deficiencies of the flap valve, and remember the flap valve is the primary septum, or by holes within the antero-inferior buttress. And remember the antero-inferior buttress is formed by muscularization, the mesenchymal cap, and the vestibular spine. So these problems produce deficiency of the primary septum, the oval fossa defect. It is an ostium secundum defect, but remember it's due to deficiency of the primary atrial septum, or the vestibular defect, and that is a problem with formation of the antero-inferior buttress. And to illustrate this again, I'm going to ask Diane to show you some specimens, first illustrating the oval fossa defect, and then illustrating the features of the vestibular defect, much rarer, but once you know what it is, it's possible for you to diagnose it. So, Diane now will show us the specimens. Here we're looking at an open morphologically right atrium. You can see the pectinate muscles surrounding the atrioventricular junction. Here's the coronary sinus and the hinge point of the tricuspid valve. The superior cable vein enters the right atrial roof and the inferior cable vein its floor. The primary component of the atrial septum or the flat valve at the floor of the oval fossa has a few small deficiencies or fenestrations. And here is our anterior inferior muscular buttress or the true secondary component of our atrial septum. If we look along the superior aspect of that muscular buttress, we can see that there is a defect and this is one of the positions that a vestibular atrial septum defect can occur. I will mention that these defects are variable in size and in position, and they can occur anywhere on this roughly rectangular portion of muscle, which is the true component or the true secondary component of the atrial septum. This is yet another specimen with a vestibular atrial septal defect, and we're looking at the open morphologically right atrium, superior cable vein at the roof, and inferior cable vein at the floor. The primary atrial septum, or the flat valve at the floor of the oval fossa, has multiple small fenestrations, so small true atrial septal defects. Here's the coronary sinus, and you can see that this specimen has a much more inferior vestibular atrial septal defect than the last specimen that we looked at. This defect is still within that anterior inferior muscular buttress or that true secondary component of the atrial septum so that this is a true atrial septal defect. I have a four chamber representation of a vestibular atrial septal defect. And here you see our pectinated morphologically right atrium and our smooth left atrial vestibule. This is the superior interatrial fold with the right pulmonary vein entering just to the left of that fold. Here is our primary atrial septum and our anterior inferior muscular buttress or the secondary component of the atrial septum. There is the area where we have a vestibular atrial septal defect within that anterior inferior muscular buttress. And it shows very nicely on this four chamber view how this defect is actually closer to the mitral valve than it is to the tricuspid valve, secondary to the normal offset of the atrioventricular valves. This specimen also had an imperforate tricuspid valve. We're looking at the septal surface of a morphologically right atrium and the right atrioventricular junction. Here's the coronary sinus, and here's the hinge point of the tricuspid valve. Here the superior cable vein is joining the atrial roof and the inferior cable vein its floor. You can appreciate that the atrial septum is quite deficient so that we only have this remnant of the primary atrial septum remaining or the flat valve at the floor of the oval fossa. 
So this is a bit quite large atrial septal defect and should be referred to as an ostium secundum atrial septal defect rather than a septum secundum atrial septal defect. The area that is typically referred to as the septum secundum is actually uh, an interatrial fold where if the flap valve was intact, it would overlap with that superior interatrial fold. So we've seen the development of normal atrial septum. We've put that into the context of true atrial septal defect. So now we can get down to understanding the sinus venosus defect. Because what we're going to show you is the sinus venosus defect depends on anomalous connection on one or more of the pulmonary veins. The key point, however, is that those pulmonary veins are not only anomalously connected to a systemic venous channel, they retain their connection to the left atrium. And it is that dual connection in part systemic vein, in part to the left atrium, that dual connection produces a venovenous conduit that is outside the confines of the normal atrial septum. So I can show you a diagram of that. Again, this is one of Gemma Price's beautiful diagrams it's from the workup recently published in Heart, together with my colleagues, from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And what we're showing you is the essence of the sinus venosus defect. Because there you see superior cable vein, and Gemma has drawn you here the attachment of the right upper pulmonary vein. And you see how in part it is connecting into the superior cable vein, but it has retained its connection to the left atrium. And it is that dual connection systemic venous connection, left atrial connection, that has created the channel between the orifice of the superior cable vein and the cavity of the left atrium. In Gemma's drawing, we're showing you an intact oval fossa. These lesions can, of course, coexist with deficiencies of the oval fossa, but the key point is that they are outside the confines of the oval fossa. So the superior, the orifice of the superior cable vein now is related to the superior rim of the open fossa, but because of that dual connection, the right pulmonary vein or veins, that area that was initially a fold has been converted into a tube. And that's somewhat of a paradox, but now Diane is going to illustrate to you how you can see this feature very well when you have specimens in your hand, and then Justin will demonstrate the same thing using virtual data sets. Here we're looking at an opened morphologically right atrium with the pectinate muscles extending to the crooks of the heart. There's the coronary sinus and the hinge point of the tricuspid valve. Here we can see that the primary component of the atrial septum or the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa is intact and well-formed. The inferior cable vein joins the atrial floor and the superior cable vein joins its roof. In this case, there is a superior sinus venosus defect or interatrial communication. And if I tilt the specimen upwards, you can see that the superior cable vein overrides the borders of the defect and is partly committed to the left atrium with the remainder committed to the right atrium. These defects are typically associated with partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. And here in this specimen, we see the right upper and two right middle pulmonary veins connecting with the superior cable vein. The pulmonary veins, even though they're anomalously connected with the superior cable vein, still maintain a connection with the left atrium. With superior and inferior sinus venosus defects, these are outside the confines of the true atrial septum. And in this specimen, you can see that I can dissect through that superior interatrial fold that lies between the inferior border of the superior sinus venosus defect and the true components of the atrial septum. 
so that this is a fiber fatty tissue plane that represents that superior interatrial fold. So what we've shown you now is that the essence of the defect is that anomalous connection of pulmonary vein or veins which retain their left atrial connection. Now, most usually, as I'm sure you all know, the defect is related to the superior cable vein. And in some instances, the vein does not override. It overrides in the majority of cases. And here we come to another potential paradox. Because that overriding can occur in such a way that the superior cable vein can be connected predominantly or even exclusively to the morphologically left atrium. Now, this is a very interesting arrangement, and I've recently been sent a beautiful example of this. And here is that example, as you can see, was sent to me by Dr. Madan Madali, who with his colleagues is work working at the Royal Hospital in Muscat, in Oman. Those of you who are watching our presentation on systemic venous anomalies will know that Madan sent me a very beautiful example there of connection of the left superior cable vein into the morphologically left atrium. This time he sent me this beautiful case where it is the right superior cable vein that receives the right upper and middle pulmonary veins, but in its entirety is connected to the morphologically left atrium. This picture here shows you beautifully the finger-like left atrial appendage. No question, but in this case, superior cable vein is exclusively connected into the morphologically left atrium. But Madan and his colleagues have rotated this late data set a little bit so that you can see the nature of that attachment of the superior cable vein, not to the morphologically right atrium, which you see there, but instead, superior cable vein looking exclusively into the morphologically left atrium. Because this is possible, because the orifice of the superior cable vein has overridden a sinus venosus defect. And there you see superior sinus venosus defect. The override is such, however, that the entirety of the orifice is now looking into the left atrium. But you can see the relationship the rightward border of the superior cable vein to superior rim of the oval fossa, and that has been turned again into a tube rather than a fold. And in this exquisite example, you can also see shunting of blood across the oval fossa defect. Now, this is an interesting syndrome in itself. And with other colleagues of mine at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, headed by the surgeon, Ujwal Chowdhury, we published a review of this entity in the World Journal of Pediatric Congenital Heart Surgery in 2020. And we emphasized the spectrum you can get with overriding of the superior sinus stenosis defect. We've repeated that emphasis in the review that's just appeared in Heart that was coordinated by Saura Gupta, again from the All India Institute. But now I'm going to ask Diane to demonstrate to you how we can get this spectrum of override superior sinus venosus defect, such as, such that, in its mildest form, the superior cable vein maintains its exclusive connection to the right atrium, then there is no overriding of the superior rim of the oak fossa. But as you've seen at the other end of the spectrum, the superior cable vein can be looking exclusively into the morphologically left atrium. So let's now ask Diane to take one of her specimens and demonstrate to you the spectrum of override of superior cable vein in the setting of the sinus venosus defect. This small specimen will show us how the extent of override relative to the superior cable vein can be variable. The right atrial appendage has been windowed here 
and we can see the coronary sinus, the hinge point of the tricuspid valve, and the well-formed primary septum or the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa. The inferior cable vein enters the floor of the right atrium and the superior cable vein enters its roof. If I tilt the specimen upwards, there is a sinus venosus interatrial communication associated with that immediate superior cable atrial junction. And here we see that the superior cable vein is mostly committed to the right atrium with only what may, might be a small component of override between it and the borders of the defect. Also, I'd like to point out that this area is that fibrofatty conduit that makes up the superior interatrial fold between the borders of the sinus venosus defect and the borders of the true atrial septum. If we look at the interatrial groove that we showed on the normal heart, here you can see the inferior cable vein, right atrium, superior cable vein, and this is the left atrium. There is that interatrial groove. And if we dissected this area, it would show us that interatrial fold. The right upper and right middle pulmonary veins have jumped that interatrial fold forming a veno-venous conduit over the fold and now communicate with the right atrium across that sinus venosus interatrial communication. They still maintain their connection with the left atrium and the right lower pulmonary vein drains normally into the left atrium. Looking at the left atrial aspect, of the defect. Here we see the well-formed flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa. It has been torn in this case. And there is our superior sinus venosus interatrial communication. Some might refer to this as an intermediate type of sinus venosus interatrial communication. The superior cable vein can easily be probed from this defect, but you can see that it is mostly committed to the roof of the right atrium. This area between the defect and the atrial septum is that area where the fiber fatty superior interatrial fold is located. So I hope by now you appreciate the essence of the sinus phenosis defect. Anomalous connection of the pulmonary vein that retains its left atrial connection. Thus far, we've been looking at superior sinus venosus defects. But it follows that if the middle or inferior pulmonary veins are anomalously connected, and if they are related to the inferior cable vein rather than the superior cable vein, then we can have an inferior sinus venosus defect. So now Diane will demonstrate this anatomy to you, showing you how again it is the anomalous connection of the pulmonary vein that retains its left atrial connection that gives us the inferior sinus venosus defect. This specimen has been dissected in such a way where the free wall of the right atrium and right ventricle has been removed. It also has a double outlet from the right ventricle with the phenotypic features of tetralogy of Fallot, a ventricular septal defect, and persistent left superior cable vein draining to the coronary sinus. You can see that the superior cable vein is joining the roof of the right atrium, and there's the cut edge of the inferior cable vein. The flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa, or the primary component of the true atrial septum, is fairly well formed with a small deficiency along the superior aspect. And you can see that rim of muscle inferior to the oval fossa and between what is the inferior sinus venosus defect. And this bar of muscle effectively represents the body of the right atrium. The lungs have been unfortunately removed, but you can see where the right middle and right lower pulmonary veins 
anomalously drained to the inferior cable vein, but still maintain some connection with the left atrium, which is where my probe is extending into at this point. If I tilt the specimen upwards, you can see that the inferior cable vein in part is committed to the right atrium and in part overrides this bar of muscle and is partly committed to the left atrium. The pulmonary veins still maintain some connection with the left atrium, but are anomalously connected to the inferior cable vein. So we've shown you the significance of the site of the pulmonary venous connection. When it is the upper pulmonary veins that are connected to a venous channel, we have the superior sinus venosus defect because they connect to the superior cable vein. When it is the lower pulmonary veins connecting to the inferior cable vein, we have the inferior sinus venosus defect. You won't be surprised, of course, to know that we can have intermediate forms if it is the middle pulmonary vein that is connected, and that can be connected to the back wall of the morphologically right atrium. And you also won't be surprised to find that if all of the pulmonary veins have an anomalous connection to the systemic vein sinus, then the presence of the sinus venosus defect can set the scene for totally anomalous systemic venous connection. So what do we need to know to understand the sinus venosus defect? I hope we've now persuaded you. Key feature to understand this lesion is anomalous connection of the pulmonary vein or veins. That anomalous connection is to a systemic venous channel, but the essential feature is that the pulmonary vein or veins retain its or their left atrial connection. And it is this feature that gives us that veno-venous conduit that is outside the confines of the atrial septum. So we're giving us a lesion that is not an atrial septal defect, but a lesion that does permit interatrial shunting, sinus venosus defect, sinus venosus interatrial communication. Well, Bob, I, I think that uh, this is usually the time where I start uh, making some comments. We have a potential I'm... problem, Norman. If, I don't know whether as Sasha is still with us, but Justin's uh, video showing us the, uh, the CT of the uh, sinus venosus defect, he sent the wrong video to, uh, and here it is. I think, it, Justin, are you with us? Yeah, if it's okay, I'll, I will narrow yes. this slide and, and show you yes, the video. So I, I apologize. As Professor Anderson said, I must have sent the wrong video. Um, so this is the example of a superior type sinus venosus defect. So we're looking at a CT data set, a fluoroscopic like image directly anterior at the cardiac silhouette. And then we'll put the blood pool back into the, uh, or we'll, we'll fill the heart into the screen. And I've colored the superior cable vein in white, the anomalous right upper pulmonary veins in green, the right side of the heart in, in purple with the right atrium, its right atrial appendage, the right ventricle, the pulmonary trunk and its branch pulmonary arteries, and then the left heart, including the thoracic aorta in red. And so we can, we can appreciate the the uh, anomalous right upper pulmonary veins, which are connected to the superior cable vein. And I'll, I'll make the superior cable vein translucent and I've colored the plane of the superior sinus venosus defect in blue. And you can see how it's just above the level of the, the SVC RA junction between, between the white and the purple. And then we'll rotate into a right anterior oblique view so we can see the level of both of these upper anomalous right upper pulmonary veins. And, and um, while, while this more inferior one 
drains into the superior cable vein. As I rotate, you can see how a, a large proportion of its wall is connected to the left atrium, which is colored red here. Um, so just as, as Diane and, and Professor Anderson had highlighted, part of the, that wall has retained its connection to the left atrium. And then we'll continue to rotate. And um, you can see right here is the right middle pulmonary vein, which is draining appropriately into the left atrium with the, along with the right lower pulmonary vein into the left atrium. And then we'll change into a, a virtual dissection image, removing the free wall of the right atrium and the right ventricle, looking at the rightward aspect of the interatrial and interventricular septum. And here is that superior sinus venosus defect just above the SVC RA junction. And the oval fossa is intact, including the superior interatrial fold. There are the two anomalous right upper pulmonary veins, what one just at the level of the, the superior sinus venosus defect and at the level of the right pulmonary artery, the other being much more superior, well above the level of the right pulmonary artery, which is an important landmark for the surgeon as they're determining what surgical approach that they're going to take. <clears throat> and then coloring the anomalous pulmonary veins in green so we can better appreciate them. And, and then the plane of the superior sinus venosus defect, seeing how just a small portion of that anomalous pulmonary vein here is, is draining into the, the superior cable vein. And then I'm gonna change into a short axis at the base of the heart. So the left atrium and the right atrium with the ascending aorta and its aortic root seen wedged in between the AV valves. And right now we're dissecting down into the primary atrial septum. And as we come up, we'll see that transition there of that superior interatrial fold, which is positioned, um, <clears throat> is positioned rightward relative to the primary atrial septum. So this is the superior interatrial fold and we'll keep coming up into the SVC RA junction where we'll start to see that the plane of that superior sinus venosus defect. And, and there is that first anomalous pulmonary vein. If we go down and you see what I mentioned before that, that right middle pulmonary vein, which is draining normally to the left atrium. All right, so that, that those are the, the features of the superior sinus venosus defect. Spectacular presentation, Justin. That's absolutely exquisite. So thank you for sharing that with us. Norman. Well, you Justin, to... while you're there, um, I've always thought about this uh, superior sinus venosus defect is that uh, when one sees the, as the azygous vein coming in, that you've reached the limits of where the anomalous pulmonary vein is. I think you showed the azygous vein in some of your specimens uh, in, in the dissection there. Could you put that back on? I'm sorry you didn't color the azygous vein for us because I think it's an important issue. Okay. Can you do it? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to. Okay. So while we're doing that, Bob, uh, let me just ask you uh, this question. Okay, where's the azygous vein now? Um, yeah, I would have to go back to the source data. The, the, the azygous vein is not opacified. So as often I've mentioned the case with CT data sets, you can see here I've had to manually cut out the non-opacified blood coming from the IVC. So I would have to do the same for the azygous vein since it's not a pacified blood. So I can't tell specifically, but it's going to be coming in somewhere in, in this area. So I would have to go back to the two-dimensional source data. I, I can show you that very clearly from my images. I can share my screen. So would you allow me to share my screen? Okay. So do you see my screen? Right. Okay, so oh, on your left side is the 
the uh, heart is seen from behind. So it is normal heart. You have the right pulmonary vein. There are three pulmonary veins coming to the left atrium. So this is a superior vena cava. So this is the azuous vein. So you can clearly see normal pulmonary vein, superior vena cava, azuous vein relationship. On the second middle is the fact that the sinus venosus defect with anomalous pulmonary venous connection, and this is the left lower pulmonary vein. So this is the azuous vein. I reviewed the uh, pretty much about 30 cases together, and I found that uh, this anomalous vein goes to the superior vena cava, never above the azuous vein. So that's, that's what point. I found. Yes. So then, in this dear image, what I want to show you is that if you look at the, the absolutely the part is right in that regard, what it is is that uh, the left right pulmonary vein retains its connection to the left atrium. However, it is always way to look at a little bit differently. The reason why I show you this is that you can see all pulmonary veins normal orientation here, but if you look at sinus venosus defect. All this area, whole this area moved rightward, forward, and upward. Mm -hmm. And so that this part of the normal left atrium has an abnormal relationship with the superior vena cava. So upper pulmonary veins obviously have abnormal connection to the superior vena cava. However, left lower pulmonary vein retains its the connection to left atrium. But however, position itself is not absolutely normal. So that's why whole thing, what I understand in this the color, the picture, same thing I showed you, this whole area has moved rightward, upward, and forward to be abnormally related to superior vena cava right atrium junctional area. We're so in that regard- I you to talk about the cable veins, June, but that's a beautiful presentation. I think the point you make is, is is a very good one. The interesting thing, have, have you seen any, whereas in the one I showed you, the superior cable vein is connected to the left atrium because presumably- So that, it, that I want to discuss with you too. So okay. if I they show you the next slide. So this is the, uh, the three different cases of sinus venosus defect shown in a similar way. So it is a matter of uh, how much displacement and the, uh, the, the thing. So there is some variation depending on uh, the number of pulmonary veins and right. then position of whole this the uh, left atrial right pulmonary vein junctional region. So in some sense that the, the, the whole area is pulled upward, forward, and the, the, the rightward. In that regard, what I find interesting is that if you have your so-called bicaval view, so this is the same. So you have a superior vena cava coming, inferior vena cava goes up. So this is atrial septum. This is what we usually call sinus venosus defect. Okay, so and then in actual view, surprisingly, it is not easy to find out. What I want to emphasize here is that actually uh, the superior vena cava down to here is always normal. And then this is a whole area actually is this left atrium pulmonary vein complex. And then question is that in this location, what is the definition of superior vena cava? Is it the posterior wall of superior vena cava? Or is it the superior wall of displaced pulmonary vein left atrium? Okay. So then the question is that if anyone thinks that this is the posterior wall of superior vena cava, and then they will say superior vena cava overrides. But however, if you know, the, my understanding is this is actually not superior vena cava, but displaced part of left atrium pulmonary vein complex. And then there is no overriding, right? So this concept is clinically important. The reason why it is, is that if you look at the normal bicaval view, in that area, atrial septum is not flat. So this is a sort of posterior part of limbus of fossa valis. It is oblique. If you have a defect here, 
superior vena cava simply overrides. So like uh, the perimembranous VSD, you have a degree of overriding of aortic valve is very sim similar passion. So the reason why this concept is important is the fact that, so this is the superior vena cava, the sinus venous defect. As you can see, if you see this, there is no malalignment of superior vena cava. Simply there is a hole, but one may feel that there is overriding. Okay, so then having said that, so this is the, uh, the case, uh, the, the clinical case, you have a big sinus venous defect seen from the right atrial side. You have multiple pulmonary veins here. Here again, this is right pulmonary artery. This is a left atrium pulmonary vein complex. Defect is rather high. And then again, superior vena cava posterior wall is a line in the lower part of the atrial septal plane. So that has the impact in the clinical management using stent now. So what it is is that superior vena cava is here. This is open right atrium. Stent is passed from the superior vena cava into the right atrium, okay? Then if you look at that from the left atrial side, that stent from the superior vena cava passed into the right atrium, leaving the defect completely into the left atrial side, allowing anomalously connected right upper pulmonary vein now effectively draining into the left atrium, okay? So that is how that the stenting of the superior vein sinus venous defect works. So they, this is the concept that I'm introducing. What it is is that what here, what you see is not superior vena cava. It is displaced part of the left atrium and upper pulmonary vein, allowing stenting of the superior vena cava to right atrium, having this vein the draining effectively into the left atrium after the procedure. But I mean, that's exactly what we've just been saying. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. but what I'm emphasizing is that sinus venous defect is, a, as you clearly mentioned, veno venous con conduit problem. Absolutely. Is it the problem of the superior vena cava or is it the problem of the left atrial pulmonary vein? And no. I think of both, but Absolutely. in the, the, the effectively, more so is that abnormal location, abnormal location of the upper part of the left atrium and or the joining pulmonary veins. But okay. not necessarily the left atrium because it's the pulmonary vein. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. But the superior vena cava is more superior actually in the normal vein. location than we what- have, We have to get that. you to talk English and not Latin. Yes, superior <laughs> cava vein, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed, I mean, uh, your pictures are beautiful and they go, they are a perfect match to what everything that we've seen today. It was, uh, these pictures of the stent are quite exquisite and uh, showing, as you say, you put your, but can, do you think if the cable vein is predominantly committed to the left atrium, as that case I showed from Madame Madali? Yeah, I think the, you know that there are exceptions always. That's the problem we have. But if I look at the almost 30 cases as you reviewed, superior vena cava surprisingly in the normal location. Abnormal location is actually the pulmonary veins. But do you think that in the case like Madan showed, if you put a stent in, you could yeah. shift the cable vein so that it then opened into the right atrium. Absolutely. The, I looked at the as very carefully because that is very interesting because that then the one question remaining uh, for proper understanding is that whether posterior wall of the superior vena cava is actually located back or the interatrial septum the, below the defect actually is shifted into the right atrium. So, but however, effectively that here, that if you, you pass the, the stent from the superior vena cava through that opening and then push the atrial septum backward and place the lower tip of your stent into the right atrium, treatment is done, yes. But then the interventionist has to know exactly what he or she is doing. So that's why that this 3D printed model is except it, they are very very helpful for for them to understand. Yes. So, it, so is this a is this a simulated 3D model that you are showing us? Yeah. 
So it's not it's so actually this is the uh, the Lee Benson did the uh, the actual stenting on the patient. Yes. So okay. this is the uh, pre-operative assessment. There is a paper in the literature now uh, by I can't remember exactly who the authors are. It was published, I think, in Cardiology in the Young about uh, surgical. I mean, interventional uh, treatment of sinus venosus ASDs. No, no, uh, and uh, they, this may wash out your mouth with carbolic. Yes, no, I, I understand that, Bob, because I was going to ask you that question. But let me finish uh, my, my statement first, that um, it can be uh, with three dimensional modeling. They are looking at some of these defects that are actually amenable to stenting for closure, uh, including maybe redirecting the superior cava through a stent into the uh, body of the right atrium. Well, isn't that and what that, just, just uh, uh, June has just shown us? That's your way Correct. Off. Right. So <laughs> one clinical pitfall here is that actually more important is whether this anomalous vein is connected to the posterior or posterior lateral wall of the superior vena cava, or is really lateral wall of the superior vena cava, or even a little bit anterior. If it is really the lateral wall of the superior vena cava, even anterior, and then this stent will gonna close that pulmonary vein. So right. that the kind of the, the uh, location of the pulmonary vein, whether it is in the uh, uh, six o'clock position or seven o'clock position, 10 o'clock position, that actually has a very important clinical implication. And indeed, June, in, in some of the cases that we saw today, the case that, uh, that Justin showed us, for example, where there was a very high origin of the right upper pulmonary vein, yes. that would be blocked by the insertion of the stent, leaving only the middle vein, then in communication with the left atrium. That is true, but however, interventionists really might want to have a little bit of a smaller stent, leaving some space behind, and then super that upper pulmonary vein still is able to drain to the left atrium after the stent placement. Yeah, it's the all matters that the availability availability of the the superior vena cava, yes, space. Superior cava vein. I can't yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bob, uh, talking about nomenclature, I think you've been very nice by calling this a sinus venosus defect because uh, I see in your recent uh, publications you have not used the term sinus venosus defect. Is your use of the term today uh, change or do you still want to call this a persistent veno venous channel? Well, I think it is a sinus venosus defect. It is a veno-venous channel. I, I think they are one and the same thing. I mean, the thing that they are not are atrial septal defects. And that's well, okay. Well, I understand that. And I apologize for uh, <laughs> my, uh, my habit of calling it that. Just, but, uh, Diane, that... Do, do, do Justin and Diane have any further comments they'd like? Diane's demonstrations, as usual, were spectacular. So I, I want to say one other thing, if I might, Bob, and that's if you let me share my screen with you, I'll show you some interesting features uh, echocardiographically that uh, also relate to um, the, um, let me just see if I can get this up here, um, to the physiology of this condition. So here is um, a, an, an echo, let's see, can I share share the screen with this? Can you see this picture here? Not yet. Okay, let me just try and share the screen. I think um, that, uh, oh, uh, I think Sasha has to permit you, there you go. Okay, so here we go. I'll just make this a little larger. Uh, this is a, a subcostal oblique picture, you can see the superior vena cava here. Yeah, hey, you're at it as well. Caval vein. Vein. The <laughs> right atrial appendage, the inferior caval vein, and the left atrium. And here you see the sort of condition we've been talking about. And I uh, am going to show you this in terms of a contrast from the superior uh, caval vein injection. And you can see that with this 
connection that there is also a right to left atrial shunt here, uh, uh, related in fact to the override. So um, it's very interesting that um, if you would do saturation measurements yeah. uh, and you gave the patient 100% oxygen, you would not be able to get the same uh, saturations as a patient without an, uh, this kind of defect. Yeah, and here yeah. is exactly the same issue. Are we still sharing? Yeah, yes. Okay, this is a, um, a uh, transesophageal echo in a small baby. Uh, let me just move it back here. And here you can see the superior cavel vein. Here is the right atrium. Here is the atrial septum, and this is left atrium here. And mm -hmm. here again is another contrast injection coming in. And you can clearly see that the, um, a lot of these micro bubbles, saline contrast, are going into the left atrium. And of course, some of them are whisked back the other way, but not all of them are whisked back. And so there is a right to left atrial shunt in this condition, obviously related to this. And if you look at uh, just echocardiographic features, this is akin to what we see with uh, tetralogy, Absolutely. where the aorta overrides the ventricular septum. Absolutely. Uh, aorta, and this isn't the ventricular septum, but the morphology of this the defect is pretty much the same. That's exactly the point that we made in the, the, uh, the review to which I referred from the All India Institute with Saurabh Gupta as the first author. And we made that precise analogy between Tetralogy of Fellow. I mean, the point that June is making about the presence or absence of override, I mean, to, to a certain extent, that is a, is a, a what's the word I'm looking for? It's a, it's a, a matter of definitions and in that he's arguing that part of the cable vein is in fact the pulmonary vein and is not overriding. But if you look at the orifice of the overall structure, as you've just shown us there, Norman, there's no question that it's what we would call override. Exactly. Um, the, the other issue about this is uh, the azygous vein is um, important because I think it, it gives you a, uh, a point above which you don't have to look for anomalous veins as an echocardiographer, but it also is a, uh, something that can be clearly defined echocardiographically uh, in terms of uh, helping uh, decide how the surgeon uh, approaches this. And lastly, Bob, I have a, a riddle for you. The riddle is why in a vein of Galen malformations do you think that there's a, an, a, a substantial increase in the incidence of sinus venosis defects, superior sinus venosis defects? That's a riddle because I didn't know there was an increase. In <laughs> I've only well, seen one. There you go. I'm sorry to... Uh, show you a curveball so late in the presentation. Indeed. But uh, the, the, there is an, an increased frequency, I know that, because I've studied it and we've actually published this. So if you have a vein of Galen malformation, if you think what's happening physiologically as well as anatomically, there's excess venous flow coming through the superior vena cava. And... It's it's in our organizer is a I put it in maybe maybe Sujun could give us some kind of answer about this. Bob, what do you want to do? We are one hour thirty minutes of meeting. So. Okay. So the you know that can I that he has just the challenge the Bob and the Diane a little bit? Am I allowed? So a little bit different topic about uh, atrial septum. So here that uh, this is the uh, the the uh, two hundred pound lady having a lot of fatty tissue in MRI. So the black is myocardium and then white is fat. So you can see that here uh, it's huge epicardial fat, pericardial fat, and then showing the two layers of pericardium very, very nicely. So what I'm showing you here is that, so you have your, your fat in the, uh, uh, 
so-called superior limbus of fossa valleys, and then uh, that extends down here. Okay, and then also here that in the uh, a little bit lower view, you see that fossa valleys, and you have your myocardium and fat in the middle. The reason why you don't want to say that is atria septum is the fact that uh, this, right? Correct. Correct. So the then my question is then going backward. So this is your antero inferior buttress. Right? Well, not entirely, because the part, bottom part is the inferior pyramidal space that is full of fat. Yeah. So the, the anyway, part. so what it is, what it is is that this is the area of uh, the extension of the uh, anterior inferior buttress, Correct. which normally has the fat tissue too. So then, no, no, why no, this area? Not normally, no, no, not this normally. area should not be into atrial, should be into atrial septum, while this is not. No, that that would, but that's not strictly true, Ju uh, June, because what you are showing there is areas that during uh, neonatal and infant life do not have any fat, and what you are showing there is the replacement of the fibrous tissue by fat that separates the mesenchymal cap from the vestibular spine. And then the lowermost part of that is the fat that is always present in the inferior pyramidal space. So it's only the top part, the ring that you are showing us that is the buttress, and that is the fat replacing the fibrous tissue that initially has to be present as the as I showed in my presentation, as the uh, per, as the vestibular spine joins together with mesenchymal cap and then muscularizes to form the buttress. But uh, if I do the MRI, I'm very convinced this whole area between the uh, lower part of the uh, the oval fossa to the atrioventricular valve that is always there is a fat layer. It's, the, you, it's not, it's not uh, the embryologically, you may say there is difference, but however, anatomically, though, in terms of layers, there is no difference in the superior part of the limbus and inferior part of the limbus at all. Absolutely, there's a difference because the inferior part is formed by muscularization of... Oh, yeah. So that, that's not, I'm not arguing. That what okay. I mean is that Post so that, as that muscularizes, it forms a second septum. The yes. fact the, the, in terms of the postnatal anatomical fact, there is no difference. And so that's why. No, that no, no, no. You're, missing the, you're missing the point, June, because the bottom part is the inferior pyramidal space. And then in the middle part, if you look at it during during neonatal life, which I have done, and when you stain that, which we've done on many occasions, there is no fat present in neonatal life. I doubt. We've looked at, we have serial histologic sections, June. We've no, the, the, no the, that is the, the, the one neonatal histologic section does not tell the story for all because even no, in adult, if you the, the if you, my heart is dissected, I might not have this. But June, you, what you're showing us there, you're showing us the inferior buttress and then you're showing us the inferior pyramidal space. Where is the boundary? Where, where the uh, inferior buttress uh, separates. This, the, you're taking us into a totally different ballpark that would need hours. Of, it's the same with the discussion we've been having about topology. You're bringing red herrings into the situation and you mm. are not helping our discussion now of the sinus venosus defect. I'm sorry. Yeah. But Justin, anyway, that, I'm supposed to show you Justin, that the Justin, goes, that they, Justin, they, how, let me suggest, Justin, are you still with us? Yeah. Yes. So when I see those images, it, it all depends on the plane that you're at, because ex exactly as you're, you're saying, Professor Anderson, we start to cut into, as you get more inferiorly, then you, you get towards that inferior 
um, interatrial fold along with the inferior pyramidal space. And if I can, if I can share, just to look back at this image here, um, I, I think, Dr. June, when as you, you were showing going very inferior here, then you're going to get into this inferior interatrial fold, and you're going to get into this into the um, inferior pyramidal space here. But the slice that you were just showing, which was which was a true four chamber slice in this area here, you, we didn't see fat in this area because we are into the muscular buttress. It, but we did see fat anteriorly near the AV valves, which represented the apex of the inferior pyramidal space. Indeed, but we're on to a different, we do have some more questions that we should try and answer, okay. if we may. Now, Sasha, is that okay? Yes, we can answer one or two maximum. We are out of, it was amazing discussion. So Thanks there's a for... question here to Justin. Justin, do you have your chat box? And Diane, I'm sorry we've not brought you into the discussions. Oh, there's a question here for Diane. Any specimen for demonstrating the scimitar syndrome? I think, Diane, you do have specimens that will do that in the fullness of time, do you not? Is Diane still with us? She might yes, have... yes. Yeah, I, I do have one uh, really nice specimen that we actually demonstrated when we did the uh, Venus anomalies. So if, the, if our anonymous attendee goes back and looks at the YouTube for systemic Venus anomalies, he yes. will see partially anomalous Venus connection and the scimitar syndrome. Yes, we, we in, use uh, that specimen. In our um, uh, app, there is a beautiful specimen of a scimitar syndrome with uh, a, a, a liver infarction because of associated arterial uh, supply and the surgeon ligated the celiac artery from which the arterial supply came, infarcted the liver, whereupon the patient died. So okay. we've a beautiful specimen of a scimitar syndrome in our app, uh, echomorphologic correlations in the chapter on um, 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 atrial communications. So Justin, there's a question here for you. Can you see your chat box? Yes. Yeah, so the question of CT uh, for pre-surgical planning, the general salt is using the level of the right pulmonary artery, whether the anomalous vein is at or below or above that level with being above, then, then it becomes increasingly difficult to do a one or two patch repair. And that's where the surgeon would consider the warden procedure. I suppose if these, if now, as June says, you can do interventions, then and insert stents, the whole thing becomes moot. June, yes. there's a, June, can you see also the chat box? There's a question here about 3D printing. You are the, and Sasha, you've done 3D printing together with, uh, with June, and you've worked on that. You want to answer that question? Yeah, so the, there are a couple of things that are related to the uh, imaging. One question is that the MRI versus CT, both are applicable. If you have a nice 3D imaging, that both are completely applicable. And the, in some sense, MRI is easier because that contrast enhancement is very, very homogeneous, while in CT scan, it's not easy to get the homogeneous enhancement, but you can do it. So the second is that the 3D printing and the modeling I would say that uh, you do not absolutely need it, but if your intervention uh, is not comfortable in doing, and then if you have 3D print model, and then also that they have a kind of, we can print and the, the uh, uh, proposed stand shape and position. And then we print them and then send them. We did the, the, a few weeks over to Cincinnati children, and then they're using that. So the absolute is the, um, uh, the application of the stenting in GOS. I would say there is the uh, doing a stenting in more than 70% of the cases. While here in Toronto, we are really uh, doing more cases. And then with the 3D printing and modeling, better understanding of you, all we are talking about. Absolutely, there will be increased number of uh, stent placement. Yes. So, uh, uh, Sasha, 
Yes. Where the YouTube channel where Hossein Nafal Nofal can find these lectures. Yes, there is a section to dedicated to Anderson series, so they can check for the this uh, type of uh, presentation. But it is the Congenital Heart Academy YouTube, YouTube channel. Can. Yes, is dedicated to this. We are going to have ten thousand people on the as a uh, attendees. So very good. So, and the final question, how do we call the different defects? We do not call them atrial septal defects. So the only atrial septal defects are the oval fossa defects, the vestibular defects, and then we have sinus venosus defects, we have coronary sinus defects, and we have atrioventricular septal defects of the osteum primum type. So I think, Sasha, that completes our uh, yes. session for today. Thanks to everybody for taking part. June, thank you for your comments. We are all moving in the same direction. Thank you, Norman. Diane, thank great dissections again. And yeah. Justin, thank you for... Uh, uh, maybe you need to send uh, Sasha the correct video so he can put that, he can insert that into the part to go on the YouTube channel. Of course. Is that possible, Sasha? Yes, of course. So, Justin, can you do that? I, yes, once I report, return from my quarantine. Indeed. And I hope everybody recovers rapidly from COVID. Bob, going, could, you, could you please introduce the next uh, session for uh, after the summer or with the new so, day, with the new things? Thank you. Indeed. So what we are discussing with uh, Justin has a very big schedule. So we're going to try to switch to Thursdays. And I hope that we can set this up starting off in August. And my proposal is that we will do one session per month. I have to discuss this still with Diane, Justin and everybody else. But I hope to do five sessions in August, September, October, November, December, up to Christmas on the Thursday now, the second Thursday or the middle Thursday of each month. And uh, we'll start that in August and we will, uh, we will advertise the topics as we agree that. I don't know whether you can see my screen, but this is the uh, reference for the viewers still of the sinus venosus defect uh, anatomic variance and transcatheter closer feasibility from uh, uh, the group in Texas. And it's good that they don't call, they, act, they correctly also call it a sinus venosus defect. Correct. Yes. <laughs> so well, thank you thank very you. much to everybody. I see you uh, soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. June, nice thank you, you, Justin. Bye, Diane. See you soon. Bye. Norman, we Bye, see you soon. All. So we will see you soon with a new appointment with Congenital Art Academy, and uh, we are supporting a lot of um, activity all around, all around the world. So we are very happy. Of course, the series from Professor Anderson, Professor Sieberman, and uh, Meryl Cohen are the most successful. So, and uh, we continue also with the Fetal series. And thanks a lot, and see all of you as soon as possible. Bye. 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 Have a good weekend. You too.